first of all, thanks for doing the podcast. Thanks for doing this interview. Um, you know, we've known each other. I want to say we've known each other since, um, gosh, I would, what was like the mid nineties or something. Um, uh, yes, I believe that's to be true. Um, I, first, I just want to thank you for having me as part of the Jerry Lynch experience. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I, I'm feeling pretty experienced right now. Oh, you are. I uh, am. I am. You know, I guess um, I, it was back when I was in Dallas. Um, you know, there was a, a friend that I had that um, was MC Nine Her Foot Jesus. And he had told me he had invested in a you know, some money into a movie and it turned out it was Eddie Presley. And, um, and then there was a producer that when I was showing my film, Angry Blue Planet, um, you know, I guess, um, you know, Eddie Presley was playing in the next, in the next theater, uh, screening in the next theater. And, uh, now, which, which festival was that like Deep Elm or something? Or yeah, what? that would have been a Deep Elm festival. Um, gosh, you know, I think we actually, I believe it was, um, Maybe not. Oh, I, I, it was. Or? It was playing. No, it was. It was playing at the Dallas Museum of Art, and I don't know what festival. It might have been. Uh, I guess yeah. it was the Dallas Video Festival or something like that. I'm, I'm feeling okay, okay. And um, and I had met a producer or a guy that said he was the producer, and uh, but I don't. No, think... I, would, I would imagine that would have been Tom Denolf, who was from uh, Dallas. Yeah, that that was him. Yeah, and uh, yeah. So and and then you know I I knew about um you know the film Red. And, uh, you know, it was like, you just, and then, you know, then I remember, you know, being invited to go to this thing in Los Angeles, um, you know, it was about, uh, Vincent Price. And I think that was the first time I actually met you. And as soon as I saw you, I said, oh my gosh, that is Jeff Burr. And it was just like, there was like a circle of friends that I knew that your name kept coming up. And I believe that was the first time we met when you had, okay, uh, you know, was that, that, that tribute, um, uh, Hazel Court was there. Right. And, uh, it was like, it's, yeah, okay. Yeah. I, I remember that. Yeah. And then it was just like it was like gangbusters. We became like you know friends, and uh, gosh, we we saw each other quite a bit. And then we, oh yeah, no, absolutely, yeah. yeah. It uh, those are the good old days. Yeah, know, I wish days. I wish they were like that now. <laughs> you know, we did have some fun. I mean, you know, uh, I, no. I, then you ended up doing some tra- you, you narrated uh, uh, did the narration for trailers of uh, some of the full moon movies, and, right? Uh, you're a particularly Phantom Town, I remember. You did a terrific job on that. You know, um, it was like, okay, yeah, I guess I should um, say that um, I also knew you from, there was a film called, um, you know, From a Whisper to a Scream, which they, uh, I guess the name was changed, or someone changed the name to The Offspring, which was it was a great, uh, you know, uh, you know, film, but also uh, inspired, <laughs> you know, a famous band, <laughs> you know. And uh, I mean, wait, wait, I've never, I've never gotten confirmation of that. And and well, in it other has words, to be. The, the lettering, the lettering yeah. is almost identical. It's the same font but, and everything. Uh, and I don't know if those guys, if, if Dexter is a horror fan or not. Oh, but, absolutely. Uh, but I've always, I've always wanted to contact the band just to see if I could do a music video for them. That'd just be a hilarious. It would be. Story, you know. Yeah. But um, yeah, but, but yeah, but the, we didn't change the title. The, the distributor changed the title from from a whisper to a scream, which was our original title to the offspring which kind of made an easier thing to put on a marquee but it didn't really make a lot of sense in context of the movie and there was, and there but, was then, a... but then 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 the weird thing was mgm who got the rights to it uh through some somehow some chain of uh documentation uh put it out on dvd about three four years ago under the original title which made no sense because mm. if anyone knew the film at all it was as the offspring in right. America, but they put it out as from Ulster to Scream, which I was happy about, but not necessarily commercially happy about. That there's some things in that movie that uh, to me are are pretty amazing. You know the whole, um, uh, uh, you know, there, there's just there's some scenes in that that uh, that are are to me pretty frightening. Um, oh, and I love the story actually. You know, and you told the story when we were at the Vincent Price tribute. Can, and can you can you? Tell the story about how you got how you guys got Vincent Price in the film because I think that is just I think that's a pretty neat story. Well, it's a true, absolutely a true story. I'll give you the the true version, not the sanitized version, but the true version. Uh, basically, what happened, and and I'd done this before uh, in my student film. I'd, I'd gone to film school at the University of Southern California, and in my student film, which was a Civil War drama, oh, divided we fall. I, uh, divided we fall. I love that. Movie. I had. Um, uh, John Agar, an, an actor that was uh, 
uh, in a lot of 50s sci-fi stuff, uh, B-movies, but he was also uh, in, in a fair amount of John Ford movies, too, and westerns. So a friend of mine had his, Courtney Joyner, who, who you know as well, yeah. uh, had, had interviewed him for a John Ford article and had his address. So I just literally went up to John Agar's house. It was in Burbank on Hollywood Way and just knocked on the door and said, Gee, Mr. Agar, I'm a big fan of yours. Uh, here's a script. I'm making a student film. And, and he, uh, oh, oh, that's great, kid. Come on in. And, 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 he, and he did the movie. <laughs> so I kind of applied that logic to uh, my first feature, and we decided uh, uh, Vincent Price, he's got to be in this movie. So, um, so, so basically I got his address, and at the time, this, was, this would be 1985, you could get – there was a service called the Celebrity Address Service. Right. Kind of like the internet now, really. Yeah. Uh, and and you could just literally uh, send them a name or or, or two of, of celebrities that you wanted their address, and for fifty cents they would uh, they if they had it they would they would send send you the address. So lo and behold, we got sent his address, and I still remember it. It was on Swallow Drive in the <laughs> uh, in the hills above uh, the Hamburger Hamlet on uh, Sunset. Oh, okay. And um, so anyway, so so Darren Scott, the one of the producers, and I, we go to his house, and we sat outside waiting, and we were kind of talking ourselves out of it. Going, well, you go in. No, you go here. The director, you go in. Well, you're the producer, you go in. <laughs> and we're just like having this argument in the car, parked across from where we think he lives, and then all of a sudden the mail truck pulls up, and, and there's a package. So the mailman gets out of his little mail truck, goes up to the house, knocks on the door. Door open, and we see Vincent Price. He answers there, so we know he's home, and we know it's his home. So, so we screw up our courage, and and we go knock on the door, and he probably thinks it's the mailman again. And right. uh, he he opens the door, and there's two idiots uh, with a script in hand, and gee, Mr. Price, we're a big fan of yours. And, and and he was so gracious. He he actually invited us in, talked to us for like 15 minutes, and really. Just wanted to find out about us and, and, and di- didn't talk about himself at all. It was all about, oh, well, well you, know, what, you know, what's your background, where are you from, blah, blah, blah. And just, just a terrific, just a, as I say, incredibly gracious. Yeah. And so we got him the script, and um, so we're all jazzed. And, uh, and about two days later, he calls, uh, leaves a message on our uh, machine, and says, well, guys, I read the script. It's pretty graphic. But um, it, there's a lot of good things in it, but I just don't know because I've been trying to escape horror films all my life, and I just don't know if this is the kind of movie I really want to do. It was. It certainly wasn't a ringing endorsement, but it wasn't a absolutely not either. Right. But but it was. But but if you were, if you get, gave up easily, you would take it as a no. Yeah. So no. So we so we go away and make the movie in Georgia, and we come back to L.A. And we cut the movie, and it's now time to do the connecting devices because it was an anthology movie. So it was a there was a linking device which had always been intended to uh, the, the the role we wanted Vincent for. So we we kind of assume he does he won't do it because it's been about six months now. So we so I decide for some reason I want Max von Sydow in the movie. Wow. And uh, it just it's apropos of nothing and. And also, it's set in the American South, and he's not exactly the first guy you think of, <laughs> you know, as a librarian in a small southern town. But right. um, but anyway, for some reason, I thought, okay, Max von Sydow. So anyway, we go to we find out who his agent is, and say, submit the script to the agent, and go, okay, we want Max von Sydow. So I get a call from the agent, who was this elderly uh, Austrian, uh, Walter Koner, who's legendary. He oh was, yeah. He represented uh, Billy Wilder right. and, and John Houston, and and, uh, and and so he he tells me, oh, there's no way Max will do the movie, but I have the perfect client for you, Vincent Price. <laughs> How awesome! <laughs> so so I made no mention that we'd contacted him before or anything. And that's how it all happened. And so we so we got we so we had a meeting with Vincent and uh, um, and the screen part of the movie that we'd already shot for him, and and he he decided to do it. Okay, now I know this I, I know this is a touchy subject, and uh, I don't want you to be afraid to to tell this story. But okay, I'm, but, huh? Uh, no touchy subjects here. Oh, man. excellent. Come on, we're among friends. As, absolutely. Okay. There was a time where my ex-wife was working for Fourier. I mean, well, I mean, in a way, she she had. Uh, 
Well, you know, she had done four, the Forty Ackerman part of the equation. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. I, I would, it, briefly, I'll tell you that I wish I had it in front of me because I would read it to you. Basically, what happened was we shot the material with Vincent, and and again, it was it was it was an ongoing. Uh, there's more to the story, which I won't get into. It's for my book, but uh, uh, it, it, it's it's a more involved story than what I told you. But that the, the, basically, what I told you is absolutely true. There was just a, a few little hiccups in the road. But we finally got him. He came and did the did the movie. He shot for two days. He was just just a total gentleman, a, a just a great guy to work with, total pro, and, and just a, a gracious, charming, all superlatives apply here. And uh, uh, because of all the the uh, there was a lot of uh, publicity because of, because he hadn't done a horror film in a while. So and Roger Corman, we shot at his studio, and he came down. Had a nice reunion with him and uh, with Vincent, and uh, pictures were published. And anyway, so the LA Times put a little blurb in their Sunday calendar section of Vincent Price is shooting this movie called From a Whisper to a Scream. Uh, he says it'll be his last horror film, blah, blah, blah. So apparently, I find this out many years later <laughs> when, when Lucy Chase Williams actually is doing the book right. on Vincent Price. Yeah. Um, uh, lo and behold, after full Forey Ackerman had read the article in the Sunday paper and immediately wrote Vincent, because he didn't realize it had already been shot, they did the article and said it was a shooting now. So he immediately writes Vincent this scathing letter, uh, scathing about me and, and, and the movie, um, and th- th- that it will ruin his career. The backstory is I had shown, because we were trying to get publicity for the movie and trying to raise more money, I had shown Forey and some other people the rough cut of the movie without the connecting device. Mm. And uh, so Forey and his wife had come to this little screening. And back then it was a rough cut, meaning there was no sound, there was no music other than the production tracks. And and you would see a scratched print. There wasn't uh, sure. clean copies like there would be now. So it was about as rough as a uh, aesthetic treatment as you would get from 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 that movie. About as primitive uh, a version of the movie as possible. So anyway, so he sees it. Then this was this was four or five months earlier. He had seen it and just was horrified, but uh, and just offended. And and so he wrote Vincent this letter saying it was a twofold letter. It was a letter saying don't do the movie because it, it's the most vile, uh, outrageously gruesome, uh, you know, offensive movie ever made. Right. And, and the, the, the first letter was, I'm, I'm taking a chance, Vincent, at, at uh, sending you this, this. I put a letter in another envelope, and uh, if, if you have the courage, open it. If you don't, don't. And it was just the strangest thing, and he would – but he said he had just taken a class in in some life spring, I believe it was, and that had given him the confidence to write Vincent this letter saying, "Don't ruin your career. Don't do the uh, from Whisper to a Screen." Now, was life spring was which, that... which, which which pissed me off because sure. I mean, I never, I never obviously had the chance or, or the desire to confront Forey about it later. But but you know, what if he had gotten that letter before the movie was sure. shot? I mean, I mean, that could have you know. Anyway. It was a very, but but ultimately it was a very, it was a very heartfelt letter to him. Yeah, there was, he, there, was that, himself, there was there was a part in the, in the letter where he says something like, uh, you know, don't let this be your your last film or your swan song or something. You, yeah, right? yeah, exactly. It, it was a, it was a very naive letter in the sense that he, I guess, Forey felt personally protective of Vincent's legacy or something. Right. Oh, and the thing and, that, the uh, thing that was hilarious. Do you remember the part where there was a where he, you know Forey says. I mean, it almost in the you know, in the way that I had heard about the letter, you know, about he you you know that that Forey identified so much with Vincent Price, and and then there was one part of the letter where he says, "Oh, absolutely, yeah." That, that well, this, he said he was the, the poor man Vincent Price, the poor man's Vincent Price, right? And then yeah, he he said absolutely. something. He said something like this. You know this uh, this kid is um, is one of my ubiquitous fans. Yes, that, that's a direct <laughs> quote. Yes, it's like, uh, and please don't let this get back to to uh, to Jeff uh, because he's one of my uh, he's one of those uh, people. He's my, my one of my ubiquitous fans who would be very hurt if he, you know something like that. Yeah. So, well, so, he lost one ubiquitous <laughs> fan. He got the fans got less ubiquitous. <laughs> now, do, that, that letter. Okay, and the funniest thing, the funny, the funniest thing is, I didn't know about this until 
the night that I guess it was Ray Bradbury and uh, Ray Harryhausen and uh, Forey Ackerman, and I brought you along, and we all went to dinner at the um, at the Dresden at the Dresden. Yes, no, no, exactly. I remember that night. Yeah, because that was just so nice of you to bring me along. That was because that, that, that was with that other guy who had the problems with what the hell the lawsuit. Oh, right, yeah, uh, yeah. Ray, Ray, Ray Ferry, Ray Ferry, yeah. And but it was just so because you were so uh, you were so quiet at that, and I and, and then it was oh, after. Yeah, so, well, cause, you know what are you going to do? <laughs> I know. You know, you're sitting, you're sitting, <laughs> you're sitting right next to Forey after you know, and yeah. then you and then you told me this story. I was like, dude, that was that's the the greatest story ever. Uh, and that was that was such a funny night because um, you know, it was just I guess it was just like the five of us or six of us and uh, uh, Ray Bradbury had had that IV unit, you know, in his yeah yeah, that, yeah yeah yeah. The exactly, thing is, exactly. and it kept coming out. And Jackie, you know, my ex wife was. You know, was putting it back in like she was a like she was a nurse or something, and uh, I, it, it just like it looked like somebody was just going to kill over and die at that table. You know? No, and, and 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 literally that was you know over ten years ago, and here you know I mean Bradbury's still standing, and yeah. and, and we just lost Corey. So yeah, uh, so that, just think about it. And Harry hasn't too. The, the sense that three, what are the odds? Three people from childhood right. that that grow up. That, that that all are in their own ways very successful professionally in exactly what they want to do, right? And they're all I mean, with the exception of Forey now, but just recently they're all still alive. Yeah. They, going into their nineties, you yeah, know. I mean, that that the odds are just staggering. Against yeah. That. yeah, yeah. But uh, but that was a great that was a great night, and just 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 the fact that you know it's like one of those things where you you can never escape being a fan, and uh, and here I am, you know, like okay, I grew up in Georgia, and now I'm I'm actually. Sitting down with you know Bradbury and uh, and Harryhausen, and it just it's amazing to me. Right, yeah, it's just, uh, stunning. Um, that's that's those are the nights that make you happier in Los Angeles. Yeah, yeah, and uh, you know, I was thinking about the other time where I don't I don't remember where you and I were, but we ran into Joe Dante. And I had gone up to him. I said, "Hey, Joe Dante, do you know Jeff Burney?" He goes, "Well, I know his films." And then he had that he had that woman with him, and it was like he could not wait to leave. <laughs> you know, it was just like, "Oh no, no, I don't want to say because he knew my films." I don't know. <laughs> nah, and I think I was like, it was like he didn't know my films. He had no idea. Who I was. Yeah, but it was like, <laughs> but, and why should he? But yeah, but it was it was so. But then, like, we were at, at the same party, and it was uh, uh, John Landis, and he stayed and talked to us for like. Like an hour or something. I mean, it was just like you, you know, it was it was pretty funny because we were. I guess we were heading to a Universal party. I think it was like a Universal Christmas party, or something. Oh, okay, okay. And then, uh, and we were. I think you and I were not the greatest dressers. I think we were in just like t-shirts, or at least I know I was t-shirts. And, t- and there's, you know, John Landis is in a full full on suit and a tie, like he always is. No, he's always he's always like that. Yeah, yeah Landis, Landis is always there. And he says, "Where are you, where are you guys going?" And I said, "We're going to the Universal Christmas party." And, he's, and he goes, "Oh." Uh, one of the party, uh, you go, so you want to go to one of the parties where you don't need a suit or tie, you know? Because I guess we look like slobs or something, you know? And uh, <laughs> but I don't know. What, those were those were the days. Um, and then I think yeah, about, yeah, absolutely. but I love the whole innocence, you know. And, and I wonder, you know, like going to someone's house, you know, going to John Agar's house or going to Vincent Price's house, you know, and being a young, you know, USC student, you know. Or, you know, or, or or just just a young person, you know, with a script in your hand. I wonder, you know, if you were in your forties going to, you know, s- some <laughs> actor's house, you know, it's like well, you'd, you'd be arrested I, I, for stalking, you know, probably. Well, or, or certainly a different impression, anyway. Yeah. yeah. I mean, and also the other thing is, I mean, definitely, and not to say it was that unusual then, but 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 it was certainly more unusual then than now for a young person to be making a film. I yeah. mean, and, I mean, now, now it's like, okay, oh, you're, you're, you're 10 years old. You're making your first feature. Okay. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, okay. I mean, so what, I mean, it, but back then it was a little, it took a little more effort to make a film a little, you had to have a little more, um, a, I mean, a little more effort, meaning, a, meaning an entrepreneurial effort. Sure. As, sure. Um, so, so, it was, so it was a little more unusual, but yeah, but now, yeah, if you did that, yeah, and now in my age, I mean, doing that, yeah, they would, uh, yeah, definitely uh, call, you, call security. Right, you, you drive up to Spielberg's house, and you just happen to have handcuffs and, uh, you know, some other, like, duct well, tape friend, in the car. This, uh, <laughs> an interesting filmmaker, uh, Damon Packard, right. kind of did exactly that with uh, Reflections of Evil. You know, not that he was an old guy when he made it, but he certainly wasn't a, a very young guy. And he ran into that constantly. Uh, you know, like, like all he wanted to do was just leave a package with his movie in it. Mm-hmm. 
uh, to you know, like to various directors or various uh, producers or actors, and right. and just the, the responses he got were literally they weren't like. And he would even if he just mailed the movie to to a, a celebrity, let's say, they got it in the mail. It, it literally the response would be not, oh, thanks for sending me the movie, or I got a chance to watch it, or I didn't get a chance to watch it. It was, how the fuck did you get my address? <laughs> yeah. Don't ever write me again. And it wasn't like he was sending a you know anthrax. He was sure. sending a movie. Yeah, you know? well, and uh, there was very the, strange. I mean, definitely definitely different times now. Yeah, I remember. Um, I remember we had we all had dinner together, and he was telling me about. Uh, I guess there was some quote. Was uh, was it reflection of people? He had like a quote from somebody. I can't remember who it was. Oh, he's got he's got he's got several. But yeah, but like like Stallone, I think gave him a, <laughs> you know a quote meeting. If I ever meet him, I'm gonna put a ball peen hammer in his head. I something. know, and I was like, how do you get this stuff? And, that, and I guess that's what. <laughs> but he but was, I think yeah. I mean definitely. I think I think the it's 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 the the paranoia factor, just in or or just the you know uneasiness factor right. in in America has grown so much that. The, the, you say the innocence. I mean, I mean, and it truly when when I was first doing it, it truly was innocent. I mean, it was you know going to somebody's house and say it was genuinely I want you in the movie because I love your work, and and I know that if I went through proper channels, I'd never get to you. So sure. I want you to know that how passionate I am about it. And that still people feel that way now, but but the uh, just the whole the whole mood of society definitely is it won't allow that. Yeah, and then that was sort and, of a... and that's unfortunate. I, I mean, that's totally unfortunate because uh, for 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 young filmmakers, because I think I think there would be suspicion and mostly suspicion and and, uh, and paranoia rather than genuine interest if 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 that happened, you know, on, on a higher level person. Right. Yeah. And and I don't know. Who, I don't know who like today who would be the equivalent of a Vincent Price. Because he was a genuine, at least to yeah. me anyway, he was a genuine movie star. Oh, absolutely. Even yeah. though he did TV and everything, but but he was a genuine star as opposed to like a character actor like, uh, let's say like today or Lance Henderson or somebody who who I dearly love. But is he really a star? I don't I don't know. Yeah. You know, yeah. so I don't know who the equivalent Robert England. I mean, would he be the equivalent of? Gosh, I, I guess yeah. to some people, I, mean, I really don't know because. Um... Yeah, because I mean that was that was just a different age. I mean that was like a, he was like a like a golden age, you know, yeah, actor. Exactly. And, yeah, um, exactly. Um, and and and, and a, an incredibly long career. Yeah, and and what's so amazing is like you know you tell people you know, they you know, like um, gosh, you know like the the love of art that he did and the cooking and of course I know he you oh know, yeah he did oh, the absolutely. dinosaur show and all those things where I was a kid where. I, you know, you'd, you just, you know, you'd see this guy who's like an icon and you would think of him from all the Poe films, from the Corman films or whatever. But then, you know, you'd see him on Dinah Shore Show and he'd be cooking and then he'd, he, where was it? I can't, was it the, um, El Centro College? I can't remember which one, where was yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, it's uh, East LA, uh, it's a college in East LA, maybe East LA College or something that, that, yeah. um, that he, that he, he donated a lot of the art to yeah, and, and, and has a scholarship fund and everything. And I remember being a little kid and, you know, cause we used to get like catalogs, we get like the Monkey Ward catalog and the Sears and all that. And there was, uh, you know, in the Sears catalog, there was at one time oh, he was selling art sure. through, through Sears. He was, he was, yeah, he was the, he was the, uh, art, uh, purchaser for, he had, he had a mandate to produce, to, Purchase X amount of uh, art for uh, Sears, yeah, and uh, and have it available in the catalog. You know, and, were... and, and the thing, I think he personified. And I forget the, I think it's an Oscar Wilde quote, but I'm not exactly sure. But he personified the the quote: uh, "Put your talent in your work, and your genius in your life." Wow, yeah. and and that, that's him to a T. Yeah, and I think you know it's it's funny when uh, people people that I know that that are you know maybe aware of his films and they always think he's from England or something. It's like you know he's from St. Louis, Missouri. I mean, you know that yeah, that yeah, just, exactly, exactly. In that time period where people you know they they sort of had the Queen's English, you know, the, as far as the theatricality or uh, of that. But time he did have a, I mean, I mean, he did have a British uh, wife for a while, and and he and he did a lot of work in England. Yeah. So definitely, there was definitely a continental influence yeah. in his. Uh, Work. Now, there's another uh, connection that we we had because back when I, you know, did the concert film Angry Blue Planet with, um, you know, Pearl Jam and Drama and all that. Um, one of the people that was sort of the producers rep for me was Ellen Kit Carson, and uh, we were like best oh, friends. Well, and... there, there you go. I, 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 you're one degree of separation uh, <laughs> yeah. on that, I think. Because yeah. yes, Ellen Kit Carson wrote Texas Chainsaw Two. Yeah, and I was. And I directed three. And when when uh, when the when the film when uh, Angry Blue Planet had come out, there was some there was some a little bit of heat and some press on it, and uh, they they talked to me about directing. 
you know, a a a Texas Chainsaw Massacre movie, and then that's and then a, the lawsuit. I guess a lawsuit between Kim Hinkle and uh, you know Toby Hooper or, or some other people started happening, and I never got to make the Texas Chainsaw Massacre movie, but you did. And then that was, I mean, it was, that was one of the things where it, it, it goes around and around, uh, you know, like you get in a circle of, of people where you just, I just kept running in, uh, to people that were either working with you or knew you or, or, or actually running into you, but you, you got to do so leather. I, so I guess it was destiny that we, we are talking today. Uh, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, Dan, now what was What's that? Up? I've never I never met Kid Carson, but uh, his his son starred in uh, Invader of Mars. I think that's and, right in uh, Paris, Texas, and he was my um, and in Paris and in Paris, Texas, of course. Being and a, he was a, a he Hunter Carson. He was a uh, he was a production assistant on my Angry Blue Planet film. And one thing I remember was we were out in a crowd, and there was a giant mosh pit. I mean, it was huge. It was a massive mosh pit. And I'm there with my camera, and there's another camera on the side. And Hunter is in front of us, and his job was. When the guys in the mosh pit started to run towards the camera because they wanted, it was it had turned angry where they were wanting to okay. hurt people, and when he when a guy would be running out to slam into the camera, Hunter would jump in and you know aim for the like aim for the guy's knees and knock the guy down. You oh know? man! And so he is getting beat up, and I and I just thought like this is the kid from Paris, Texas. You know, <laughs> it's like. This is the kid from uh, Invaders from Mars that's doing all this. This is Karen Black's son, you know. Um, I was going to say, Karen Black's the mom. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, so you, you got to do Texas Chainsaw Massacre 3. You get to do Leatherface with, with yeah, our yes, mutual friend, R.A. 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 Mahaloff, who, who, was, who was one of the actors in my uh, student film, Divider We Fall, so yeah. who, who hung out with John Agar quite a bit. Yeah. Bringing that around. Uh, and I thought he'd be the perfect guy to play Leatherface, just know, knowing him and knowing his sensibilities. Not that he's human flesh, but he's a, a big guy who likes to romp around. And, and then, uh, so 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 I I did offer it to Gunnar Hansen, but uh, it, there was no money. Hmm. They, they, they New Line would only pay scale, so uh, so he he turned it down. Yeah, I think uh, yeah, I think he he wanted like scale plus ten or something like that, or yeah, yeah, he, he didn't even want that much more than scale, really. Yeah, yeah exactly. And um, oh, I just just, just uh, yeah, just a stupid uh, a stupid decision on their part on on that, but good for RA. The thing that I remember the the, the in, most interesting thing to me was you know was in in the leather facings was years later, where I was at New Line, and I think. Uh, I don't know how I got involved. I can't really remember how I got involved, but they were, I guess it was the, the, um, like almost the, like the director's edition laser disc was coming out. And oh, oh, gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. The, they, well, it wasn't, yeah, not the director, but the, yeah, the, the uncut. Yeah. So called. And, yeah. and, um, I guess, you know, um, oh gosh, was it, um, Michael DeLuca, you know, was, okay, yes, yes. was like, you know, the big guy. I mean, he was like, uh, you remember he was like the, uh, most powerful well, no, man. He ended up, Oh, he ended up being yeah, a huge, uh, huge guy. Uh, I mean, I mean, you know, big, big, big. I mean, he, like Spielberg wanted him to run DreamWorks at one time. And yeah, he did for a while. Yeah. And then there was the. I remember going. I was at. I was at New Line, and I remember. Um, I guess there was like an Italian poster for Leatherface that was pretty awesome. I believe it was. I believe that's what it was. I believe it was the Italian one. And the woman at New Line said, "You know, she goes." Yeah, we really want this is the the look we want for the thing. Can you go and get that original um you know poster? I said, Where where is that? She goes, Well, you'll just need to go to our foreign department. It was still in New Line. But she didn't want to go from her office over to the you know, like into the next oh, okay, okay. You know, it was like this there was all this political in stuff going on. Where I don't know if you remember that whole incident, but it was just like you know. It was no, like, I don't remember that at all. I, yeah, she, I, I don't know if I've ever seen the Italian poster. Yeah, she, but, uh, yeah, you know. Um, the no, whole and, and, and I'll tell you this: I, I, after I did Leatherface, the next time I went into a New Line office was to be interviewed uh, for the DVD that came out in like 2004 or whatever. So, so I, I literally didn't sit foot in that office for 14 years. Yeah, yeah. So well, uh, I mean, that was a pretty um, a mutually uh, I, a mutual uh, agreement. I guess. Yeah, I guess the thing that I was thinking is like, here's a woman that you know she wanted this for. I guess they wanted it for the disc, like maybe some extras. And uh, okay. I said, well, 
why do you want me to go do it? Because it's just, you know, it's just around the corner down the hall that you can you can get that stuff. And she says, well, it wouldn't be good for me to go do it. I mean, that's all. I mean, I was thinking, like, how is this company running? You know, I mean, wow. you know, I just remember how weird that was. And I was thinking about. Um, well, so, well, when I did the movie there, I mean, it was again, it's, about, it's certainly my most well-known movie of all the movies I've done by by a long, long shot. But it was probably the one I worked on the least amount of time because it was, I came on at the last minute. And it was a very short post because it was supposed to come out in November. So so really, I worked on it from July to November and um so 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 my, my so my experience at new line was pretty limited in terms of actually being in the office that that much but but the it was a weird time to be there because they were just about to i mean i guess the talks were in works to do to merge with uh or to, to be part of time warner right they were still new line it was still a totally independent company um when we did leather face yeah you know and i remember you know I used to, I used to you know New Line was a cool it used to be a really oh cool, yeah oh absolutely know. yeah I remember absolutely. I remember going and seeing films um you yeah, know, John on, Waters stuff I mean yeah on, know, on a the early you remember going I remember going on to college campuses you know there'd be like these film clubs and it would be a New Line film before I mean it was just like when you know he was just um uh, you know uh, I want to say you know Shay was just um you know, I forgot his name yeah Bob Shay Bob Shay just uh, yeah, yeah it was, out of New York and and you know because he released. As I say, he released the you know the, the early John Waters stuff. Yeah, and, uh, yeah. It was, I think I think they released Evil Dead, didn't they? Uh, yeah, I think. Well, uh, I think so. It was just like all these you know in things, America. You know. Yeah, and it was just all these you know. I think the whole his whole outlet at that time was just colleges. I don't think there was any you know, and uh, you know I remembered it from there. I was like, wow, you know this this company is really growing. And you you know you, you you know you went to their offices and you know I guess it was the sort of the house that. Um, Nightmare on Elm Street had built, I suppose. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, definitely. That 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 totally. Uh, yeah, Nightmare on Elm Street and the sequels. You know? Did did you? I mean, it must. I mean, I know the stories. You know, have been out there, but I mean, that must working on. I get, things were pretty much taken out of your control, as as a lot of things happen. Well, but, but in, in, in in their defense, I was a very naive uh, filmmaker, and this is certainly it was my third feature. But my first feature that my brother and and Darren Scott, who was a friend from college, weren't involved with on the producing side. So it was really – so so again, I was a fairly naive uh, um, director in that sense. But I was a very upfront, a very, very guileless, and, uh, and, I, and, and, and I said, well, you know, look, if I'm going to do this at a short notice, I need to have, uh, you know, as much you – know, as much control. In other words, you've got to trust my decisions, and – and I was kind of operating under the illusion and delusion that they wanted me to direct a movie, and and that really and I'm not saying it is a woe is me, not at all. I mean I'm I'm a professional and been through the ringer, but uh, good and bad. But the thing is, I was operating thinking they they liked my stuff and that they they thought saw something in my previous work that that you could apply to this movie and or you know some kind of talent. Right. And really, I, I'm not kidding you. I, it was really I was the only director because time was ticking. I was the only director that that accepted the job that they would approve. Mm. The, and and that that doesn't mean they want you. That just means that they they settle for you. Mm. So really, it was like it's like being married to a woman who who thought you know she was going to marry Brad Pitt and she gets uh, Charles Nelson Riley and she's just <laughs> set, she's just settling you know and and and, and you're thinking oh she really loves she, she really uh, loves me and not the case at all you know and you end up getting divorced which is exactly what happened and my last words to Mike DeLuca I think were something in the vein of I want my name off a fucking movie <laughs> I want my name off a fucking movie. <laughs> And he hangs up. <laughs> so, so, but I, uh, I imagine that mu- that that chutzpah, though. I mean, you think about you know how young you were at that time, and then you know for them to say you want your name off. Why would you know, like? Why would you want your name off the movie? You know, it's like we're New Line you know, because it was recut by it was recut by New Line. Then then it was recut by the MPAA. Right. Know? No, I'm so, just so I'm just really, saying. You know. I'm yeah. Just, I, I mean, but but you. I mean, here's the thing. I've always felt this. Uh, and again, it's a naive, it's a naive thing. But it's just the only thing I have is my name. Sure. You know what I mean? As a director, because you never can print out uh, programs to give to people at the beginning of the movie that 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 to hear the director's disclaimers. Yeah. So so all you have is your name, and and my name has been 
you know, kind of, uh, and, and, and partly my doing too, but it's been kind of de- devalued many times because of, of the, the movies I've done. Well, it's weird though. I remember, at, you know, at that time when you when you were going through those troubles, and I remember, okay, you're you're creating. You know, elements in there that, you know, is, is a horror. I mean, you, you know, that are uh, elements of horror, you know, and, and those are being taken away. I mean, it's like, okay, we're... No, we're and met, that's the thing. Well, here's the thing. Here's the other, the other thing which I didn't really understand. DeLuca was the one that really wanted to do the movie. The rest of the, Shay and, and Sarah Richer in particular, who was around a lot, mm. um, who was the kind of de facto second in command. She was friend of Bob's from, from way, way, way back. He'd been part of the company for since the inception, I think. She hated horror movies. Horror movies in general, she hated. And they were very offended by this movie. And it's like, well, then why did you make it? Right. You know? Because they'd seen the first movie and they distributed the first movie, you know, uh, in the reissues. So why... And, and the second movie, certainly... You can't say the third movie is gorier than the second one. I mean, so what do you what do you think you're getting into? Yeah. So, so really, it was, a, it was just a, a a perfect storm of uh, of disaster. Yeah, and, uh, and and then there was there was you know when I when I was talking to you know some of the people at uh, at New Line at the time, they were talking about all you know the elements that had been you know removed at the time when you were making it and that. I, I guess they had cut the negative, or, or you know, they were well, saying see, what, what was happening. Yeah, what was happening was we were, we had a release date of November third. That it was the theaters were booked, everything was, and and this would have been in September. We're, we're we're editing the movie in September, so to make the release date, as we're editing and mixing, they're cutting the negative, hmm. and then we would submit to the MPAA, and every time they would submit. They would cut it more and more, and then the negative would be cut as well, just to, so it would, so everything would be ready when the MPA finally gave the R. Boom! Because they could they could make the thousand prints to to get it out there in November, and a different era then because everything was done a little more by hand and uh, photochemically, and mm-hmm. so now it wouldn't be but you could do a thousand prints very easily uh, because there's outsourcing in Canada and everything. But but uh, now. I mean, back then it wasn't as easy. So, so anyway, so so it was like the negative was being cut as we mixed and as we resubmitted the MPAA every time. It was resubmitted, I think, eleven times, so like twelve times total. But there wasn't which at the time was at the time was unheard of. But yeah, it even made made like front page Variety news. Oh yeah, which was just incredibly surreal, you know. But also, wasn't there Uh, there was like chunks of of scenes that I, I remember hearing. You know, uh, Bob Shea actually going into the editing room and just taking. No, that happened before. That actually happened. What? What? How it all? How it all went down was we had a test screening, very typical thing to do, like late August. Uh, we we wrapped the movie like uh, early August, and we had a test screening late August um, of um, uh, of the movie in, in some some place in Burbank, and it t- tested pretty well. But it was the first time that Shea and um, Rolf Mitwig, who was the head of oh. Foreign, yeah. saw it to, uh, all put together at one time. And, and Rolf basically said to Bob, he started screaming at him right after the screening. Mm-hmm. And the screening went pretty well. It got better numbers than, I mean, not that it matters, but it got better numbers than Nightmare 5 and some other stuff they'd just recently done. And, and the audience liked it, you know? Mm-hmm. And and so Rolf goes, yeah, this, this movie's going to be banned in every country. I have to sell it in. Why did you make it? It's so bloody, blah, 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 blah. And again, not that it was anywhere near as bloody as the second one, but it was, you know, it was kind of nasty. Yeah. And it had an overall kind of nasty tone. Sure. So, so then the next day, Bob Shea comes in the editing room, and we literally go through the whole picture, and he goes, "This goes, this goes," this, and and literally just cut out. And this is before the MPAA, so mm. so that's why that's why I wanted my name taken off the movie because it really felt that it was it was so different. And, the, and, and the, it wasn't like recut; it was just cut. You know? Yeah, and those and those scenes were lost, right? I mean, I mean, yes, they, 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 they certainly. We were editing on film, yeah. and uh, and and nothing was really transferred to video. And there, there's there's some there's some uh, there's some outtakes, not outtakes, but there's some stuff that's on the DVD from a transferred work print of of the first screening that we had. There was a video made for some executives from that first test screening we had. But, and yeah, that's what exists on yeah, part that, of that exists on, on the work print. That was another thing that was in that conversation I had with the woman from New Line, where she said we would like to, you know, we would like to get these elements, and she was asking me if you had 
any of those elements. And I've said, I, I just, I just remember thinking how funny it is that this company, they were the ones, you know, that were, were going in and cutting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If anybody it. has the element, yeah. If anybody has the element, they, they, they would. Yeah. But I think I, I can't remember. I guess there must. You know, I guess I did. I, I guess the dailies you could get on video because they, they had them transfer on video for the executives to watch. Mm. So there, there are dailies. You know, some video consists of dailies, but but they're dailies. You know, so, so you know, no, um, it, it was never finished in any way as sure. for any director's cut. So know. you go from that. You know, you 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 you've had you know in a way a horrible experience. Although the story has grown and 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 you know, it's funny. I I, I can watch the movie now, and and there's, it, it, I almost. It, there's a nostalgic feeling about it, and it's still to me, it's you know, well, because it, well, it's a 20 year old movie, yeah, so, and it's, so that that's part of it, yeah, sure. and, 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 it's, and it's, it's Viggo Mortensen in it now, and oh, you, yeah. so you see him now, and you you know, so yeah, it's got some nostalgia, it's got instant nostalgia, yeah. In you know? fact, it was so funny, I, I you know, I went to see The Road, and there was like, there was a couple of moments in the movie <laughs> I kept thinking about, you know, <laughs> I kept thinking about Leatherface, and I was thinking, like, oh, yeah, there's he. He almost looks the same, <laughs> you know. Uh, he really a, does. He, he really little, does. Um, you know, so you go from that experience, and and you know, you 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 know, you go back and you read like the lore of Hollywood, you know, especially you know, you know, the, you think about Quentin Tarantino, or you think about uh, Paul Thomas Anderson, or or even like you know, back in the day with George Lucas, where someone stood their ground and said, okay, this, you know, you know, they they sort of taken a, a, a scene where a studio has mangled you know some work of theirs and and they've fought and and they've somehow prospered but i would you know you almost think well okay like, <laughs> and the, and there's the other side of the coin. yes the other side of the coin and and um you know i just uh i, I mean i think it it must be so painful to have something well no but, here, but here's the thing and, and again this is I, i've got i've got very little um i've got i've got self-awareness so so it's one thing to fight for Sydney, aka Hard Eight, mm -hmm. and 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 Reservoir Dogs or whatever, but it's another thing to fight for Texas Chainsaw Massacre Three. Right, right. You know, in, yeah. in other in other words, in other words, taking a movie that that on on a certain level can never be yours. Sure. And fighting for it is a whole different deal than taking a movie you've written or or that you've just you've you've created in some fashion, originally. And fighting for okay now because because the stakes the stakes are a lot a lot uh, higher the stakes the stakes are a lot higher the the, the the ceilings a lot higher in other words let's say you fight for Leatherface and win or whatever at the end of the day okay <laughs> you know it's going to be you're still it's the second sequel to a groundbreaking movie from ten years earlier right you know? yeah so you know you then you know. which of course I didn't I couldn't really articulate then I certainly can now with some perspective but. But 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 I've always, I was always taught and I've always felt that you've got to put yourself in the movies regardless of what it is. So that's Absolutely. what you're fighting for. You're, it's really you're fighting for your identity. Sure. You know, and, and, and not to sound so highfalutin. No. no no no. But, but that's it, really what you're doing. And and get your, your your vision or whatever pretentious word you want to put on it. But because you put yourself into these movies and that's any movie you do. And that and that's that's always been my. I guess it's a strength and a weakness. On a commercial level, because because most of my movies have been, um, you know, work for hire commercial movies in, in the like a, a studio system movies, you know, in in a sense. Yeah. And I, I would be the one. I would be the studio director that would always get suspended, I guess. Uh, but but never made the Casablanca or the uh, the, the big movie that, that would have kind of uh, let him ride on the suspension. So so it's a it's it's a tricky a tricky thing, and and and. I don't know how differently I would play it now, but it, but it's a whole different deal now. Leatherface would be a twenty million dollar movie minimum, and would come out in two thousand theaters, and it'd be, the stakes are much higher now for I, for a theatrical movie. And I guess you know I'm thinking this is you know eighty nine or ninety, I suppose. And I'm thinking you go through the whole situation with the studio, and and, and you know, and then. I would say, you know, you, you're probably thinking, okay, you know, what am I doing? Let me, I'm going to go back to the whole offspring or the divided we fall. I'm going to go and round up money independently and do my own thing. And I guess that's, and then Eddie Presley. Yeah, that's Eddie Presley. Yeah, that's, and exactly, that, that, that's exactly the origin of Eddie Presley. And uh, that's exactly it. Now, that, and and that and that's like that movie sat virtually unreleased for years. So 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 that was a, it would be a great story if that movie 
played Sundance and won a big award or something, but but it, that wasn't the case. And in doing that movie, I turned down Hellraiser three. Mm. So which happened? Not that I would have turned it down, but it just it happened right as we got the money in the bank for Eddie Presley. I, I get a uh, call saying, "Hey, uh, they need a director for Hellraiser three. They want you going and meet." You so really... I went and met, and met him anyway, but it was just like perfectly bad timing because I couldn't go to the Eddie Presley investors and go, oh, well, you know what? That money in the bank, let's keep it there for another nine months and, uh, yeah. and we'll make this thing next year. It just wouldn't work, you know, because they would they would immediately, you know, get cold feet and pull out the money. So, And, I'm, and I don't regret the decision at all because I, I, Eddie Presley was one of the great – and I hope to have more of them, but but it was one of the great experiences of of, of my film life. Uh, just just in, in the making of that movie, the process of making that movie was I learned a lot and just got to work with some great people. And uh, yeah, that that has an amazing um, you know uh, assembly of people on that film that that went on and you know did did some great things. And uh, I think that that's got to be a kind of rewarding thing to see. You know, like. You know, yeah, I mean it's it's a, it's a totally unknown movie, and and uh, and and it's one of those things where some a few a few uh, a low percentage certainly really like it, and then most of the people that see it don't like it. Yeah, it's really a polarizing which, film, isn't it? Which is, which is fine, you know. I mean, I mean that's that, I mean that's no surprise. No, I remember but, I remember uh, seeing it. I remember seeing it, and um, uh, I just remember you know being with a couple of people, and and it's like after the movie, I said, wait. Is, did, did you guys even see the same movie I saw? I mean, I, I, you know, it's one of those things where you know you go with someone and you you think, well, okay, I know this person, but then they watch it, you you watch it with them, and it's it's it, it had one of those things where, you know, you go like, well, you know, you know, you walk out and it's you have compl- you know polar opposite opinions of the film, um, but but I, I think, um, you know, I mean, like uh, Dwayne Whitaker, he's in that, you know, and uh, and I mean. And then Quentin. I mean, that's uh, that's didn't he, you yeah. Know. No, it was always a weird. It was a weird thing where where it was like um, I'd met Quentin earlier, and, and uh, um, and I forget all the chronology. I mean, Larry Tierney was an actor that we both shared yeah. in in in, in, in uh, Reservoir Dogs and in Eddie Presley. So he was kind of a common link. And then also the one of the act actresses in Eddie Presley was like the assistant production coordinator of Reservoir Dogs. Yeah. Very very strange um, um, crossover, and uh, and Quentin Quentin did a, part, a little part in Eddie Presley, and uh, um, you know, and and then I don't know what ever happened to him. <laughs> but, yeah, um, but, and, um, but but you know, just the the you've had you know you've been involved. Fan. Yeah, you've been you've been you've had you know, like why weren't you the Jew Bear in? Uh, <laughs> well, you know, I, 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 physically I would have been a better match. <laughs> I mean. I, that that, that uh, just physically, I mean, no denigration on Eli Roth's acting skills, but just just a phys- as a physical presence, the way they built him up, and then you reveal it's you either want to reveal it's a midget <laughs> or 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 it's, it's an eight foot guy. You know right. what I mean? Yeah. And it, you, you get nothing. You know, because because the build up is so big in the right. tunnel, you get bat, baseball, bat, baseball. So so either you play against the audience expectation and it's a midget, uh-huh. or, or you play. We totally with it. He's a, he is a bear, you right? Know I mean? Right. <laughs> so, so that was, that was very strange. Uh, but um, uh, then, and after after you know Eddie Presley, I mean, I I guess actually during Eddie because well, you did well, after five, Eddie after Eddie Presley, my career was basically I didn't have a career because that, that took me out of the loop for a while, and there was I was not getting any offers. The first offer I got, and it was just by a fluke. Was to direct uh, two episodes of Land of the Lost. Uh, now in that, yes, absolutely. So, now to me, that's amazing because I was thinking. Um, I guess uh, you know when I I did you know I was working on a TV show for IFC and uh, and you had done Land of the Lost and then I, at that time I wanted to do this segment where I was going to you know cover the making of um, oh gosh it was I, what was it yeah. Uh, Oh, the, 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 Jack, the, uh, Armstrong, that, Jack Armstrong, yeah, Hero Jack Fire. Armstrong, aka American Hero, yeah. aka Oblivion. And you yeah. were working with, um, <laughs> you know, and, <laughs> Timothy Bottoms was the uh, star. Yeah, yeah, and, and from Land of the Lost, right? And and yeah, exactly. Yeah, because he he'd he'd, uh, he'd been the new Mister Porter in uh, in that. Yeah, and then and, this, uh, 
So, yeah, I mean, so, so, yeah, so, but so that, I'm just saying that that's the only offer and it wasn't even an offer. It was just like a, an opportunity to meet. And then, then I got the job, but, um, uh, just that was a, after Eddie Fresh, it was a very weird time, uh, just, just career wise for me, you know, cause it was just a, an odd. Yeah. And that was the thing. Cause that, there were people that, that I knew that, you know, were aware of your work and it was just one of those situations where it's like, well, this is weird, you know, because you know, what, you know, you think about, you know these other people that you know that that do the Sundance. You remember the, or or some festival, and you know they they hook up with some some producer that is a go getter, or they get some sort of management that's out there. You know, really, you know, you know, um, you know, pumping that guy and getting getting the word out about that guy. I was thinking like, it just seemed to me that you weren't getting the. You know, the, well, I mean, here's the thing. I made I made very I made a few critical errors on the representation side. And that was totally my fault. And and the other thing was, quite frankly, and again, I'm not saying this to be woe with me. It's really just a, a cold, hard perspective on a career and, and hopefully uh, a cautionary tale for your listeners who want to be filmmakers. Basically, I, I never, to this day so far, doesn't mean I won't, but to this day so far, I've really never made a movie that anybody gave a shit about. Meaning, re- really critically of the big guys or commercially. Yeah. So you know what I mean, and that's just the cold, hard fact. If I made a movie, if Leatherface had come out and made thirty million dollars, even though people thought it sucked, it, it, it would put you in a different level. I'm not saying it would be, oh, it would make a career, but it would, sure. it would definitely you'd be perceived a little differently. You know, I, because I, in in Hollywood it was perceived as a flop, even though it wasn't. I mean, it made money and it still makes money, but. It was perceived as as certainly not a hit, you know. So, and right. I've never made a movie that's been. I've made a lot of movies that have made money, but they've really never been perceived in the industry as a hit. And I've never made a movie that's been a a slam dunk uh, critical success. I've gotten I've gotten the way I put it. I've gotten just enough good reviews to kind of encourage me to continue. Yeah, I, I guess the thing I, I think about is um, well, you know. You sort of got into the into the sequel thing. I mean, you you did Stepfather too. You did yeah, yeah uh, absolutely yes, and that, that was Chance totally of... by no by no intention of my own or anything. But yeah, but that was back then. Even now, that was a kind of a training ground. You know, that's yeah. how I looked at it. But yeah. but I, I actually I actually held probably a cinematic distinction, which was I made a sequel, a number three. Then a number four and a number five in in order. <laughs> yeah. So, hey, yeah. man, when you're a director like me, you hold on to every little uh, bit of uh, publicity you can get. It's and that, that's literally true. I did uh, Stepfather two, Leatherface, uh, Chainsaw three. I did Puppet Master four, Puppet Master five. Then if I I, could, I tried to get Halloween six, but it, it didn't work. Oh, and you did Pumpkinhead. You did Pumpkinhead too, but I guess that came out of that came out. Yeah, that, I mean, that came that came that came after yeah. Puppet Master Four Five. And and I I guess um, I don't know. I mean, the thing is, is it's hard. You know, it's like okay, I want it. I want to do, you know, because for me, I was thinking like, you know, I remember there were so many people I knew that that had seen Eddie Presley. And it's like if it had been done at a different time, it was like, was it it was it released like you know two months too late? I mean, it was just like it was just like this timing thing. I thought you know. That well, no, and that, I mean, I'm not saying that's the case, but but certainly timing is a big factor in. I'm I'm convinced that if Leatherface had come out on the original release date, which there was no reason why it shouldn't have, uh, the MPAA was just being a, a total bastard, uh, that it would have made ten million, yeah, instead of six. You know, yeah. I mean, I mean, and, and again, not does that really mean that much? No, but yeah. but you know, I mean, I, I think yeah. it's all timing. It is. It's all timing, and and. It's, but it's always been that way, right. and 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 it can it can work in your favor too. It's kind of for most of my stuff, I think it's worked against me so far. But but it can work in your favor too. Right, and I think but, about but, you know, but the, hey, look the other the other side of the coin is there's no guarantee. There's no guarantee, and this this is shocking to me to think about years later. But I I never thought about it because I always assumed it. But there's no guarantee that after you do a number a first movie that you'll get hired to do a second movie. Mm. Yeah, you know it's, what I mean? It's, it's, like, okay, yeah, let's say you make your yeah. first feature. You make your first feature independently. There's no guarantee somebody's going to hire you to do a movie, right? And so, so I feel eternally grateful to uh, ITC for hiring me to do Stepfather Two because because there was no guarantee you'd get another movie. I mean, 
you would hope, you would think, but but there's no certainly no guarantee. Well, you know, it's, it's and, and now even even worse. Oh, I think about how you know naively you know when you read you know the, the biographies or or the you know chrono you know the chronology of like independent film or the independent film movement and that kind of thing. Where you know you you read this stuff and uh, you think, okay, well, I'm going to go make an independent movie, and then the, they're going to be knocking on the door, and and it, that isn't the case. And I think about someone who wants to make film their own films and make you know you know do their own thing, like 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 they, you know you did, and 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 go out and because I mean, there's I can see I've heard you know you talk about this where you you know you you've got your own money, you've got your own story. I mean, there's n- nothing more pleasurable than assembling. You know your own product, you know, and uh, you know compared. So that's to, the joy of film. Yeah, that's yeah. definitely the joy. And then you know, but the thing is, you also want to work, and you and, and you want to pay your bills. And it's like, okay, well, I, let me work in something that can be a training ground, like doing the sequels, and uh, and you hope that um, you know you can you can get the stories to make your own personal work. I think. Well, um, well no, here's the thing. Basically, one of my faults, I think, uh, is. And it can be a virtue too, I guess. But but I really love doing it, and it's an addiction. So so I'm not the I, I could never be Kubrick. Forget the talent. Take the talent part of the equation out. I could personality wise, I could never be Kubrick because I, I couldn't go eight years, ten years between making a movie. Yeah, I, I'm just not cut out that way. So I'd I'd much rather. Yeah, I mean, make a lot of movies. I mean, and, and and so that's a you're known for the movies you make, but also the movies you don't make, and the movies you turn down, or the movies you your career is defined kind of by both. And uh, and and so that's been a whereas I see them as training, and, and and I learn on each movie. The producer in Hollywood looks at the IMDb page and goes, Jesus Christ, this guy's a hack, which which is nothing can be further from the truth. Right. If you know me, I mean, yeah, you know, I, and, and if you talk to me, I mean, absolutely nothing could be further than the tr- from the truth, and then just a, a guy who doesn't give a shit and just does anything and and d- does a pedestrian job. I mean, I give my all in everything I do, but I can see how they would make that impression just looking at a yeah, just looking a, at the, just the, the yeah. filmography, you know, right. sure. Um, you know, I, I, you know, I think okay, going back to American Hero because I, you know, that, I was actually on the set a lot. Of course, I was yes, just, yes, you were, and I, I would love to have that uh, footage that you shot. Yeah, that would be a, uh, <laughs> I remember, you know, I remember uh, there was one time machine. I remember there was like a, I remember shooting with my own sixteen millimeter camera at some some riot scenes, and I remember taking it. I guess was it. Uh, who was the editor of that? He, he you know, um, uh, Bob Morosky. Bob Morosky, who went on to great acclaim, um, hey, and and nominated for Academy Award. That's right. Uh, I remember him. I remember showing him the footage of the six, and he goes, he goes, well, we should use this footage. This is like better than what. You know? well, I remember him, you know, saying that it was just something that was just like a throwaway. You know, I had a, a wind up sixteen millimeter camera, and he yeah, says, you did one of those Kragnagors ones, didn't you? Yeah, yeah, I do. I still, I still have that. I love that. I mean, I, I, love, I love those. Yeah, I almost like I keep thinking like I should just put this on eBay, but you know, I mean, because but you know, you couldn't get probably two hundred dollars for it. But I, I still think well, I might use this. You know, I just can't. I can't let that camera go. I shot so many things with that, but. um but I, I had so much fun. And I was thinking that was um, an interesting project because I guess it had started off. Was it Jag? No, what was it? Jaguar. No, it, it, it was a crazy project, and 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 and, and the the it's it's it, it's it's the bane of my cinema existence because <laughs> what, what happened was I got hired to do this movie. This was back in like ninety five, ninety six, where there was a a very short lived craze of interactive movies, and there was going to be an interactive division. All the studios had them. And literally interactive movies, not not uh, video games per se, but sure. um, but movies, and they, they, they had choices with. And there were there were a few high profile ones that came and went. Called one was called Mr. Payback. I remember that was the mm. one they were touting. And uh, so basically, Atari was going to make this movie slash game called uh, Jack Armstrong, um, which was kind of a, a James Bond slash. Pre-born identity. Kind of thing. Yeah, I mean, it used to be an old radio show, right? Wasn't it an old radio well, show? Well, see, they, but here's the thing: they didn't even know that. But I mean, they, I mean, I, I, it, it's just stunning. It was stunning <laughs> that they didn't know. We, we we were telling them all through shooting. Well, Jack Armstrong, you know, that's a the Jack Armstrong, All American Boy, which is a radio show. Blah, blah, blah. Oh, we have the rights. We have the rights. So, as it turns out, 
like about uh, the last day of shooting. Oh my God, we can't use Jack Armstrong's name. <laughs> and it's like, and, and literally every character, because it's a video game, uh-huh. essentially a game, we go, Oh, Jack Armstrong, so good to see you again. <laughs> I mean, it was like the word Jack Armstrong was, was all over the movie, so that had to be dubbed. But what happened was, again, this is a perfect storm of, of, of disaster. Uh, Atari basically goes out of business during the making of the movie. Right when we finished the editing of the game, the, the it was for the Jaguar game system and the Christmas sales at that time were so horrible that they basically pulled the plug on it and then very soon after Atari went went out of business. So I figured, okay, well, that's the name of that tune. That, that, that'll never come out. So then about eight months later, I get a phone call just totally out of the blue from the producer saying, we just got the deal. We just sold Korea on making a feature version, which they had retained the rights to, a feature version of Jack Armstrong. So, so Brian Muir, a good friend and I, and, and, and myself, we wrote a, we used the game as kind of like we'll take this action scene, this action scene, this action scene, and then wrote a whole new script around tying these action scenes together. Yeah. And we shot for another eight days uh, with Tim, with Tim Bottoms uh, to make the feature version, and that's Bob Morawski cut that, and it was called American Hero. That's all right. And it was uh, financed by. The, the South Koreans, basically. Wow. And uh, so what happened was, for some reason, for, for Korea, they needed a 35 print. We had shot the movie in 16, so we, we, had to, we were going to actually make a film print of it, which, which uh, was relatively rare then. Now it's almost you know, unheard of to, for that lower-budget movie to, to, to get, need a film print. So, so the negative needed to be cut, so... We hired a, they hired a, a, a negative cutting company, and I yeah. guess they had gotten busy yeah. uh, unexpectedly on a bigger show, so they farmed it out. They subcontracted the negative cutting of American Hero to another company who totally botched the negative cut. Yeah, I remember I mean, that. I mean, like, yeah. just, just stunningly botched it. Yeah. So the producers ended up taking an insurance settlement on the movie. Yeah. Which probably was more, not probably, definitely was more lucrative <laughs> doing that. <laughs> it was like the producers, you know, it was like like a more lucrative uh, not having the movie come out than than, than it kind of. So it so it has never been finished uh, totally, sound wise or music. So it sits in it sits in limbo and and literally what just happened the producer of the movie and now it's it's fourteen years later. Yeah. So the movie's worthless, you know. It, it's if anything, it's a very obscure uh, library title right. uh, that you, for somebody's library. Um, called me up and said, you know what, you've uh, you did so much work on this movie. I was going to scrap it because uh, I didn't want to pay the uh, lab uh, storage fees anymore. Why don't you just uh, come over and t- just take everything? Uh-huh. It's yours. So I own American <laughs> Hero now. It's in my apartment in Los Angeles. We should we should uh, in, in we should put that boxes. on DVD. <laughs> well, no, well, here's the thing: to put, I, I definitely want to do that, but it just it just it's got to be finished in the yeah. sense there's got to be sound work done. So so it, there's a certain amount of money that needs to be put in. I'll do all the voices. So, I'll I'll do all no, the no, characters. No, no, voices. Oh, you oh, you'd be great. Uh, <laughs> but um, but it's just you know sound effects and stuff. So it would be sure. it'd be a minimum. You know, probably twenty grand to to get it to any kind of acceptable level. This just for me. There's something about that that whole experience. You know, uh, uh, here's the thing. I, it's it's still one of my favorite movies. It's it's a it's a, it's a six pack movie. It's a fun bad movie. Yeah. And uh, there's a lot of action, and they, you know, it's got an interesting. It's, it's, if, if we ever do put it out, it'll be Larry Tierney's last movie. He plays a general. Yes. Jeff Corey's in it. Yeah. Um, Willard Pugh's in it. Sage Stallone's in it. Uh, it's a very, very strange little cast, and uh, but Tim Bottoms is great. In it. Uh, he is, it's, and, it's, and, he, and he gave himself over to it, man. He's yeah, great. Yeah, he really and he, and what a what a what a nice guy. I mean, like I remember just, you know, hanging out on the set with him, and he of course he did that little piece, you know, for my IFC thing, and I just thought like, well, this guy is like really down to earth, you know, you know, cool guy. Yeah, no, really, just a fascinating guy, and uh, I was just so happy that that he happened to look like uh, Bush, and uh, yeah. And it did probably is the only guy that's ever done a a comedy series yeah. and a serious movie, both uh, d- during a sitting president playing the sitting president 
in a comedy version and a uh, serious version on you know uh, high level stuff. But because he, he did a he did a nine eleven movie for Fox that he where he played Bush. Yeah. Um... But going yeah, course, like you're, yeah, and, but I remember there's just being like the you know we we shot it or you know you shot at Sepulveda Dam and I remember there being some excellent yeah, exactly camera setups. I mean, <laughs> I mean as far as like framing and stuff of the of the water coming down, I just remember thinking like wow this guy, you know you. I mean it's just like I just thought like you know he's got a great no, there's, eye. There's some, you know there's there's definitely a lot of fun stuff in that. I I, I it's it's a a wish of mine, a hope of mine that that again it's for nobody other than me. Just, just to get it out there, and just to get it, because a lot of people put a lot of work into it, sure. just so, just so people are able to see it. Yeah, and, 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 and that, to, that to me, totally the victory of any film, certainly independent filmmaking, is just getting the movie out to where people can see it. After that, all bets are off. Yeah, you yeah. know what I mean? Because I mean, there's so many things out of your control. But yeah, at least get, have it available for people to see. That's, you know, that's all that matters. Yeah, you, know, you know, you've got the. I mean, there's like terrorist elements in the story i mean oh yeah, oh, yeah. Well, but here's the thing it's, it's so pre-cell phone though that oh yeah cause, cause literally but you can make a joke about sure. it but he, literally he goes to pay phones all the time <laughs> to call into his office but you know i remember and, yeah there, there's yeah and then uh but you know the whole thing the element where i, I guess they're poisoning the water supply uh yeah oh exactly yeah that's exactly the whole, know, the whole shtick yeah, and that and exactly. that was you know and that like in the whole 911 stuff i mean there was you know there was all this all those possibilities yeah, well, see, that's the thing i mean the movie you'd have to i don't know you'd, i mean sell it as a period piece because it's pre it's so pre 911 and it's, it's, it's definitely a, 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 a an indication of how the world has changed since then, and, and the world, not just America, just you would you would watch it. Anyone watching it would go, "Oh my God, this had to been made, yeah. you know, way pre nine eleven because well, dude, there's no reference to uh, uh, sure. There's a reference. To, I, mean, I, I don't even think, quite honestly, I don't know if the word terrorist is even used in it. I don't think so. But the thing I remember, you know what I mean? I yeah. mean, I mean, it's, it, I mean, it's certainly they would be. It's a terrorist organization that's doing it, sure. but they, they're not called terrorists. But yeah. the, but I remember uh, after nine eleven, you know, there all these. I was reading all these reports, and one of the things that were that uh, you know supposedly they had found. You know some of the plans that some of the terrorists were going. It was like it was uh, you know poisoning the water supply, and I was like, I, that, you know, like so a moldy Jack uh, script of Jack. <laughs> I, know. I know, and here's uh, where we got our ideas. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, but I I always thought like that would be so great, you know, to get you know Tim Tim Bottoms back, and you know he's an older guy now, and he's sitting in a you know he's being interviewed, or you know he's maybe like some sort of courtroom thing. And they're oh, and, a framing device. Yeah, oh, a framing device. Idea. And they're asking that's him. That's a great idea. And the whole thing is that okay, these are the heroes you never hear about because they avert, you know, they averted or they, um, they, uh, you know, they kept terrorism from happening. And no, so we don't. Like, I mean, this would be in horribly bad taste. But you'd go. So you think 9/11 was really the first uh, major terrorist attack that, uh, that happened in America? You know, yeah, sure. and, and, and uh, let me tell you the story. About, yeah. <laughs> and oh, that'd be hilarious. Yeah, and then you got the whole giant cell phones, and I mean, the Amer I think there's a isn't there? Well, a no, shot no, no, pay phones, man. Well, I, isn't, <laughs> yeah, isn't, isn't there one in there though? I think isn't it like a giant brick? The guys. Oh, there is, yes, yes, there, you're yeah. exactly right. Yeah, there is. Yeah, exactly. Yep, yep, yep. But uh, okay, so you know, so you've done. Uh, so, well, that's a great idea. So that's. Uh, I can write that's, that for uh, you. Worth the right. conversation right there. That, you know, that's a, and, and I think Bottoms would be up for it. Oh, absolutely. And the thing is, is you know, it's it, it, it writes like butter. I mean, butter is actually flowing out. I'm writing it right now. <laughs> but, um, okay. Well, it's like cheese, I think. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's like cheese is flowing out of my pen. <laughs> yeah. But um, then, uh, let's see. Uh, gosh, you know, there's so many things. I mean, you know, uh, the one of the, the funniest things, and, and I had no idea until later, but – uh, I have a niece that you know, you know, I can say she's <laughs> she's my niece. I, mean, I know I'm biased, but she's you know beautiful. Um, but you know she she was sort of you know she was you know she was on um, a couple of seasons of Lost. I mean you know just as sort of a background person, she'd done all she was living in Hawaii and done all the stuff. She comes back to to the Midwest. She's from Missouri, and I think she was like you know she's like a I don't know, you know doing modeling and that kind of thing. And she calls me and she says I've got this. Uh, gig for doing a film called mill mascara i don't know, maybe i'm pronouncing it wrong but like versus yeah, the aztec yeah, mummy mill mascara mill mascara yeah. it's pronounced yeah. both ways yes and uh yeah. Yeah, one of a stranger uh advance in my career but, yeah i uh, had and i just thought that was so bizarre that uh, that you know she was but who's your who's your niece 
Uh, her name is Callie Lentz, and uh, you know she's you know tall and thin. She I don't think she did the movie, but I know she was. No, she did. She did. That's what I'm saying. It's like my God. I mean, I would have known that. Yeah. And I always thought, like, how great would that have been, you know, for for you guys to actually work together? But okay, so you you know, you, but you did this. Oh, you, this is. A, I was so excited because I remember uh, my, when my dad was ill. Uh, he had you know Alzheimer's and dementia. And all this. I remember going back and forth from California to the Midwest, and I went into a Walmart and I saw you know uh, straight into darkness uh, on the rack. And I mean, there was like you know, and, and in this area. Was there any dust on it? No, 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 not at all. I mean, it was like, it was, alone, it was a great, lonely. It, it was a great display. And I thought, uh, I was like, this is so cool that, you know, that, you know, because you're in, it's in the perfect place for that movie to be seen. You're in a, you know, in a Walmart where in that you know particular area. Yeah, well, the, no, the funny thing on that movie, it did, I mean, it doesn't seem to me that it came out that long ago, but it's you know, like going on four years hmm. now. If I did, let's say I had that movie to sell right now, you couldn't get a distribution deal on it. Really, nobody would pick that thing up. You know, you know, I mean, for any kind of for any kind of money or any kind, there might be a few little places that might pick it up for no money that barely would put it out, but it would never get. It's it just it's just that's how that's how quickly the market you know collapsed or changed or yeah. whatever. Um, it, it, what it would be that like IFC might pick it up for video on demand. Mm. That would be the the kind of uh, end game for it. But it was so cool because DVD, it, was... there, it would be just be it would be a very very small company, you know, like Synapse or something like that might put it out. But but a, but a niche distributor, but like a Universal who put it out would never put it out now. You know, it was on the shelf yeah. right next to Band of Brothers. You know that you know, and I thought like, wow, you know, it was <laughs> like you excellent. Go. You know, I, think, I would I would want that because it never came. It hasn't come out on Blu-ray yet, so I'm I'm lobbying the company to to retitle it "Little Glorious Bastards" <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and and change the ad art and uh, and uh, uh, re-release it. Okay, so how do you then? Now, isn't Straight Into Darkness that's something you 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 got private money for as well, right? I mean, what's the yeah? Story? No, exactly. I put everything I had in it, and and we got some more dough and. Uh, you know, the, the limited partnership, you know, LLC. And someone and uh, and you got tanks. And just, uh, you've got you got all sort. You know, it's well, well, but it was written, but it was really it was it was kind of in the Rodriguez sense or the Cassavetti sense of uh, written around things that I knew I could get. Yeah. Um, in the sense because I'd done all these movies in Romania and uh, gotten to be really good friends over there with a production company and the, the director of photography formed this production company and basically kind of went in as, as partners on it. Yeah. And uh, so, so I knew kind of. I mean, I wasn't flying blind on what we could get, but but because um, I we we had very little money and uh, to do that kind of movie, to do an ambitious movie like that, and uh, so so it was part of it was written around locations that I knew and and uh, had shot some of them, some of the time I'd shot in before and and uh, so 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 it was it was kind of written written backwards in the, in that sense. In other words, I had the idea and then and kind of like. Oh, this would be a good location. I know that place. Blah blah blah, and just kind of put all the pieces together. The cinematography, I think, is is really good. Uh, there's there's some really st striking images in that film. No, I'm, I mean, I mean, it's, I'm too close to the movie to to really comment on it. I mean, on any level, I, I hate it. <laughs> I hate it all. <laughs> but but uh, which I think is like a common thing with with directors. Sure. I mean, but uh, but 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 it's just the, the director of photography I've worked with many many times, Durell Sergovich, just. Terrific guy to work with, and uh, uh, I love him to death. He just shot. Uh, there's a guy who won Can a couple of years ago, a Romanian director named Christy Puyu, and uh, who did The Death of Mr. Lazarescu, hmm. and he just shot his new movie. Wow! So, so I, I'm sure that'll be playing Can uh, in May. What do you, what's what do you got going on now? I mean, you, you have a, I know you have a, you're one of those people that have several projects in development um, yeah yes i, I do I, i've got the uh, here's the thing my next independent movie that i do is going to be a comedy because i've really never done an out and out comedy and uh so that's really what i want to do i've got this uh this, this script that it's 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 a it's an it's it's an out and out comedy but it's also other things too but but it's it's definitely comedy first drama second whereas eddie presley was a drama first comedy second yeah and uh so anyway, so so that, that's what I, that's that's the project I really wanted to do, and I'm ho hopefully to do it this spring. A uh, very low budget, very very almost no money, 
But uh, well, you got to squeeze me in on something. <laughs> no, 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 absolutely. I mean, dude, I, um, but but you know, a few other things too. I also I'm working on this documentary I've been working on for years, and I'm still interviewing people. But it's a documentary called Inside the Tube, and it's about TV directors that you've always seen their names but really know nothing about. Oh, and, well, that uh, sounds like from, from the from the golden age, and we would do a lot of stuff about TV movies that are kind of forgotten and. So, so interviewing guys that have been making movies for from the fifties to the to the nineties. Oh, that sounds like an excellent. I love that. Kind and of you stuff. know, like, and they're like guys that did guarantee you that did, did the, your favorite episode of you know Man from Uncle or, uh, or you know <laughs> yeah. whatever it takes a thief, and they did the pilots for like the Big Valley and I did just so, so I've, I've interviewed like ten of these guys so far. And they're putting it together, and and I've got about three or four more to do, and oh. really, really fascinating guys. Yeah, that's and me. And they've that really never like... gotten, they've never gotten any real attention, you know. Yeah. I mean, and, and, and but they have just a body of work that's just, oh my god. Yeah. You I, know, like I mean, literally hundreds of hours of, of of film TV, you know. You know, there's a, there's a scene uh, that I really love in The Big Lebowski where you know they go to. Uh, you know, they go to this guy's house, the guy's in an iron lung, and he, you know, he was, um, you know, I guess was he had written a few episodes of, of their favorite, you know, old TV show. I think it was Brandon. Oh, okay, okay. And, uh, and I remember, you know, that whole scene when, when they're doing it, says, uh, you know, and John Goodman saying, uh, I'm, we're, we're a real big fan of your work, you know. And uh, I, I remember thinking at the time, you know, that that would actually be an awesome story. Because I remember at that time I was doing, I was doing some, every once in a while, some volunteer work at, uh, uh, the motion picture, you know. Um, oh, the camp, the home. Yeah, the, the, the home. home or the... Yeah, and I would go in there, and sometimes you know, you, you could, you know, you could go in there and read to somebody, or you could just, you know, do the bingo thing. I know that sounds weird, but I kind of always sort of did that stuff. Even as a kid, I would go to nursing homes and that kind of thing, and I, you, you just would meet the most fascinating people that had, you know, worked on on shows, and then, uh, you know, that and they were in this home. They had, you know, still had just great stories. And I always thought that that would be an awesome because actually I got into it because a friend of mine, Mike Carano, had told me a story. He he was um uh he I believe or, or I believe this was him or maybe he was telling me about someone. I'm sure it was him though, where he was dealing with somebody and Three Stooges was on TV and the guy never missed watching Three Stooges, and the guy says, "Oh, you know, we never got that right." And he's like, well, "What do you what do you mean we never got that right?" And oh, it, so it, was it Larry, Larry or was no, it uh... no? It was like uh, uh, Jules um. Oh, oh, Jules White. Oh, yeah, okay. and, and I just like oh, oh sure, my. sure, sure, sure. I was like, oh, that is an awesome, you know, an awesome story. You you just want to go and capture these these voices and these stories before no, they fade it, away. No, really, it's, it's an oral it's an oral history of a of of a part of filmmaking that that will never be again. Yeah, because, because there's no there these guys did so much stuff that it's impossible, no matter how much you like to work, to have filmographies like that anymore. Yeah, I, I know, to do to do all these because they were doing you know thirty five episodes a year and they were doing yeah you know, each TV show had like thirty two or thirty three episodes a year plus there was just a shitload of uh, dramatic and, and comedic shows whereas now there's only a handful because of reality TV. Yeah, I mean I just think I think that's a, a fantastic project. I, I can't yeah, no, it's something really I'm really passionate about just because these guys, as I say most of these guys have not gotten any recognition. In their career, and they're, they're and they're really they're interesting guys. I mean, they're fascinating, and 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 for for young filmmakers, there's some really interesting perspectives, um, you know. And then there's some anecdotal stuff that's just hilarious, yeah. Um, you yeah. know well, about about certain TV shows or certain actors. Or, do you have one that comes to mind? Well, I mean, Jack Lord. I mean, just to, uh, like the, the, I interviewed the guy Reza Badia, who 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 had done the title sequences. Major TV director too, but he'd done the title sequences for Mary Tyler Moore and oh. and Hawaii Five O, and he wow. told this great story about getting this helicopter shot of Jack Lord for the opening of the of that title sequence. Right, it, it he, zooms. He's on the build on the roof of the building. Exactly, and it zooms exactly, in, yeah. exactly. And, and Lord is just screaming uh, throughout most of the takes because the, the helicopter was interfering with his hair. Oh, no. The cue is like blowing his hair, and oh, he goes, God. "You motherfucker! Uh, this shouldn't be a helicopter shot!" And blah blah blah. <laughs> <laughs> Because he was so worried about his hair. Uh, you can't. Well, you, you can't mess that hair up. I mean, I always thought it was like helmet hair, almost. I mean, you. you know. Yeah, I know. It's like yeah, it's like uh, you know, brill cream and Vaseline together. <laughs> um, Blackered. Yeah, you know, I have a friend that did a a film called uh, or a documentary. It started off as just like a small little thing, and then it just kept growing and growing. But it's the, uh, it's like the golden age of Broadway, 
And uh, you know, he did. Okay. It's, it's really great. I mean, you get, get Ben Gazzara, and I mean, he just you know he would get one person, and then that person's oh well, you know, you need to talk to is this, and it would just be like this constant. It would be like this virus that was you know expanding. Well, that's, that's kind of how this has grown too, because it's definitely started out being something small and I just wanted to meet this one director and then uh, it kind of grew and grew and grew and uh, so so it's hopefully it'll be finished if not this year the the beginning of next year wow. but it, but it's, it, we're, we're well into it what do you have a title yet for it inside the tube inside the tube okay I'm writing that down um, um, what, what's what's something you got anything and else then, then also there's a I have a website that's about to launch oh. uh, com. very easy Okay. Remember, and and on that website, there's going to be a documentary, which is hilarious, called uh, "A Decade Under the Innocence," which is about Super 8 filmmaking in the 70s. Oh, that I'm wow! I'm so excited about that. I mean, that's with, a, with re- clips, with all, it just just it, it, it really illuminates, and and I think people will find that it's like everybody almost had the exact same experience in Super 8. Yeah. And, and I know we're making films in Dalton, but you know, you guys in in Texas or people in Illinois or whatever, they're they're exactly doing the same in in a parallel universe. It really is. You know, I mean, doing the same stuff. You know, because almost every filmmaker made a James Bond parody. <laughs> almost every filmmaker made a horror film, a yeah. goofy comedy. I mean, it's just you know, like all that stuff. So you know, I remember so, like so, growing up reading. Remember Super Eight Filmmaker? You remember that magazine? Yeah, I love. I sure. sure I sure, love sure. that. Yeah, and then like a Cinemagic. And uh, you said magic, yeah, because like and we did, I didn't subscribe to those, but I, whenever you could find them, it was like it was like, oh, it's so great to get, yeah, you know, Cinemagic, yeah, definitely remember that. Uh, the, the, those were, the, I mean, it, it was really neat, it was before the internet, but there was like a community. I remember you could write in and there'd be like a little bulletin board. I mean, everyone communicated with each other, and uh, it'd be a you know, a story about somebody, and you could you could you know, r- you know, write to that person, you know. And, I mean, it was uh, it was a fun, you know. And then I guess you know it goes from that, and then it was the early days of like film threat. You know, it was like it just sort sure, of yeah. All... You know, I remember seeing film threat for the first time, and it's getting a huge kick out of it. Yeah. And, uh, and then 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 uh, then when they went, that's how I met Chris Gord. When they went to uh, when they started publishing in, in L.A., I just uh, called him up. Yeah, and you know, it's, it's funny because uh, right, I guess. You had done some when Chris Gore started working for Larry Flint, and they were doing. Um, I guess he was doing. I guess he was doing some stuff on Hustler. Oh, he, he did the photo funnies on Hustler photo funnies. and some other. <laughs> I, I don't know, Hustler, is there another one? I can't remember. Definitely Hustler. Yeah, definitely I, Hustler. And I don't know if he. I, th- I know that, that he had done like uh, some surf or a skateboard magazine. I wasn't sure if Gore had worked on well, that. Was he just thrash or something? Yeah. Or, yeah there, there was, Which was and there was a friend of mine actually, a guy I used to know from uh, USC, Rich Lang, who was who was editing uh, some of those magazines. Yeah, I um, think it, it, Spike Jones was involved uh, at, at that time, I believe on 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 that. I think on one of those okay. skateboard that, magazines. That I didn't know. But um, but I just remember <laughs> you guys actually appeared. <laughs> I mean, can I say it? You actually appeared in in a, in a shot in, in in one of the hustler. Uh... Yeah, absolutely, yes. It was Ron, me and Ron Zwang were the uh, goofy, you know, goofy guys in a couple of those things. So, I mean, how cool is that? I mean, that you're you know doing these movies and you 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 can say I was in a hustler <laughs> issue. You know, I, I, I yeah, probably a lot more than that. Yeah. I, 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 <laughs> I, uh, you know, it's it's all part of the uh, multimedia experience. Sure, absolutely, and uh, I, I so I, I hope uh, when when the the website comes out, you'll be able to have, you know, some content on there that that you can um, use to generate, you know, some, um, you know. Well, here's the thing: the, the purpose of the website really is it's basically it's kind of to combat the impression you would get just on my IMDb page. Well, I don't know if I can say in a in a nutshell, you know, it's, it's like in other words, you think you know this guy, well, you really don't. Hmm. Yeah. Go to the website, and now you will. I guess I'm. I guess I know you. So it, I mean, I'm not. I'm. I don't think there's anything that I. No, I don't read anything. Oh, well, well, you know, there won't be any surprise. You, know, you, yeah, I don't think you'll have too many surprises. But, but there'll be. Some, but it's fun stuff, and it'll be. There'll be. Uh, it just total um, a, a lot of stuff that you can only find on the website. You know, behind but, the scenes pictures and the usual the usual stuff a director would put on, but. But then it's like just, just just the history of how I got into stuff and, and uh, uh, so so it's, it's I mean if you had any interest in independent filmmaking or filmmaking in the eighties horror filmmaking 
uh, you, you'll love this one. Well, I, 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 of all the filmmakers that I've known, I, that I, I, you were always working. I mean, you were always working on something. You had, you know, you, you always had uh, numerous projects going on at the same time. No, so, and, and that's the thing. And I've got so many that I still want to do. Yeah. So, so I, I, I'm, I'm just now ready to shift gears and uh, start that. Uh, proverbial second act of uh, my career and, and the thing that that um i'm excited about is if any listeners or any any you know people that are interested in you know independent film i mean you have a you know a wealth of knowledge i mean because you you know you've you know you know oh, as a so matter of fact that's, as a matter of fact i did uh teach at uh, florida that's, state university that's right yeah and uh and i i would love to teach again too i mean i mean that my ideal thing would probably be because here's the thing. I mean, I'm, I mean, of a certain age where they're not going to hire me to do. Here, here, the irony is this: the the movie The Stepfather, the remake, came out in uh, the fall, right? Yeah. I don't know if you ever saw it. No, oh, yeah. But anyway, so I've the seen remake. You've done. Of, okay. Okay. No, no. I'm saying the remake of the the, the theatrical remake. Did you oh, see out? Oh, yes, I did. Yeah. Okay. So let's say that was a that was a relatively it was like a moderate it wasn't a hit but it wasn't a flop mm. it came out so let's say they do a decide to do a direct to DVD sequel right and it's called Stepfather Two yeah okay I couldn't even get a meeting on that <laughs> I, they wouldn't even they wouldn't consider me for a second and that would be like the that's the exact movie I did you know yeah. what I mean so 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 that that is enough to tell me that. There, I have no future as I am now in the commercial film world. In other words, no one is going to hire me to do anything. And if they do hire me, it'll be for a very small little movie that'll be inconsequential. Okay, well, how? No, that, would, that, would not, that would not bring my career anywhere closer to where I want it to be. But how, how so, important is that as far as, I mean, is there, I mean, can you, couldn't you, couldn't you just keep making your own? Personal, well, that's what that, well, yeah. that's what I'm trying to do. But then, how do you make a living? Because making a personal movie, yeah. generally speaking, unless you're unless you get lucky, and by luck I mean it's a combination of talent and skill, like T. T. Anderson and, and and Quentin, they they were very lucky in, in the in the in the sense that certainly Quentin more that his first movie was a hit. In other words, the harder thing to do, or the or the what would have happened if Reservoir Dogs came out and didn't make any money? Mm, yeah. You know, they got they got they got like say, like let's say mixed critical reviews and didn't make any money. Exact same movie. Uh, yeah. who, you know, who's to say? I mean, would, would Pulp Fiction be his next movie? Maybe not. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know is, what I mean. But but is there like I mean I mean I know it's I know it's we're in. So, so, so all I'm saying is is, yeah. is 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 doing doing independent films unless they become the cause celeb of that year. Yeah. It's almost impossible to make to make money. You know, I remember so, there being a time where you know, if, if you you know sent in the you know films in production in the Variety or um, you know what was it, um, or like uh, um, Hollywood Reporter, I remember if you just mentioned you, you just put that post in there that you're making a film. You know, oh I, sure. I remember like and getting, you get phone calls. Yeah. And, and, oh, absolutely. Our first movie. I mean, absolutely. I mean, yeah. that, and that, but that's completely changed. Yeah. You know, and I, now I, to get and it's the thing. I, I'm just so grateful. If anybody ever contacts me or or calls me or whatever, say, "Hey, I just saw one of your movies," it's like, it's like this day and age to have someone watch a movie for an hour and a half or two right. hours or whatever. It's a gift, man. Sure. I mean, just because that, that's a because that's uh, it's so rare because they somebody all under, their time interrupted watches a movie because all their time's taken up either playing video games or they're on uh, exactly, or, or on YouTube. Exactly. You know, yeah, exactly. I, it's so funny. I, I you know I do these little you know sometimes I'll do the, like a little vlog or something where I'm just talking on on YouTube and it'll be I mean at most maybe five minutes and and I'll get an email from someone said. Oh, that was yeah. I couldn't really watch it. That was too long. I was like five minutes. You couldn't <laughs> set for five minutes, you know. And um, yeah, so. no, that, but that's 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 the, the way of the world now. Uh, and that doesn't mean that you should stop making movies or anything because no, nobody watches them. I mean, I mean, definitely people people do watch them. And people will continue to watch them. But it's, it's just it's just harder to make to make uh, to make money on because there's so many movies out there. And what's unless you have some kind of hook or some kind of uh, uh, of, of of signal to get through the white noise of what's out there, um, it's it's very difficult to make a living. So, well, so my I, ideal situation would be to teach and then be able to make a, a, a movie on the side. Well, I would love that, to that see I could, you. That I could call my own. You know? Sure, I would love to see you actually do um, a documentary on 
you know, just sort of a teaching documentary about making film because there's, you know, there's, you know, you know, so many things, you know, how to like do special effects that are like, uh, you know, cheap. You well, know but, here, to... but here's the thing, but, but I, I, I was going to write a book at one time and, and there've been so many of these books that it is kind of pointless, I guess, but, but it, it's write a book on, on, on filmmaking, my ideas on filmmaking and my, my experiences. And, and the title was going to be, this is a direct quote from a, uh, uh, a producer he goes, he was an Israeli producer. He goes, you know, you're the best of the shitty. <laughs> 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 and I would like the, the greatest quote ever. And so that would be the title. So if I ever do the autobiography, that's going to be the title. <laughs> that is awesome. And I'm going to let that be <laughs> the final note on this podcast. Jeff Burr, it's so okay, great. Well, to... if, I could, if I could throw in real something real sure. quick, uh, there is a special screening, which I just got word of at the American Cinematheque at the Egyptian Theater, which is a great theater, sure. great venue, of Eddie Presley on March 31st. I don't know when this podcast is going to air, but it, cut it out if it's going to air way no. after that or whatever. March 31st uh, of 2010, uh, Eddie Presley is going to be screened at the Cinematheque with a lot of guests. Wow. A lot of special guests. With Quentin Tarantino there. You oh, know, well, you know he, you know he'll be there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, wow. Yeah, well, I don't know if he ever saw the movie, quite honestly. Uh, but uh, hmm, I'm but, sure. Uh, who knows? Well, I'm sure, uh, I'm sure he saw a little bit of it. I know Lawrence Bender saw the movie. Well, that I, I do know. Well, if Quentin's in the movie, if he's at, you know, he's seen the movie. <laughs> well, you would think, yes, you would think, but, <laughs> yeah. but uh, you never know. Um, well, okay, it, man. Well, uh, this is, is, is incredibly enjoyable to me, and uh, thank you so much for uh, for even wanting me on your podcast. Because that's, uh, I know you have many choices, for, yeah. many choices on on uh, people to experience, and yeah. uh, thank you for. Uh, Letting me be part of the Jerry Lynch experience. Oh, that's very great. Well, it's it's great talking to you, and uh, and and thanks for and thanks for doing this. If anyone wants to get in contact with you, I'm sure you uh, you have an email contact on jeffbird.com when when it yes, finally exactly launches. It. Yes, exactly. Yes, yes. And uh, yep. um, so, so go there and uh, and you, and you co- contact me at uh, any point. All right. Thanks so much. Okay. All right, Jerry. Jerry has a Facebook friend.